From New York, this is Democracy Now! I did what I came to do. Number one, identify areas of practical work our two countries can do to advance our mutual interest and also benefit the world. Two, communicate directly, directly, that the United States will respond to actions that impair our vital interest or those of our allies. President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin hold a three-hour summit in Geneva, pledging to work together on cybersecurity and nuclear arms control while resuming diplomatic operations. As for the return of ambassadors to the locations where they work, to Moscow for the American ambassador and to Washington for the Russian one, we've agreed that this issue is solved. They return to their postings. We'll talk about U.S.-Russian relations with Anatole Levin of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Then we look at the mayoral race in New York City and how ranked choice voting will be used to decide the winner. The candidates held their final debate last night. And the worst idea I've ever heard is bringing back Stop and Frisk and the anti-crime unit from Eric Adams, which, one, is racist, two, is unconstitutional. You don't have to worry about danger when you have private security in your, on your block. Uh, I don't and never will allow Stop and Frisk to be returned and abuse people. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin met in Geneva Wednesday for a three-hour summit. The two leaders of the world's largest nuclear powers agreed to set up working groups to deal with nuclear arms control, as well as cyber attacks. They also agreed to send ambassadors back to their posts in the United States and Russia. Biden said after the brief summit that both parties had agreed not to renew the tensions of the Cold War. It's clearly not in anybody's interest, your country's or mine, for us to be in a situation where we're in a new Cold War. And I truly believe he thinks that. After headlines, we'll have analysis of the Biden-Putin summit with Anatole Levin, senior fellow for Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. The German drug maker CureVac says its COVID-19 vaccine showed an efficacy of just 47 percent in a large clinical trial. The disappointing result is just below the 50 percent threshold set by the World Health Organization and far below the roughly 95 percent effectiveness shown by other mRNA vaccines produced by Pfizer and Moderna. In the United States, Arizona Republican Governor Doug Ducey issued an executive order this week barring public universities and community colleges from requiring students to show proof of vaccination to attend class. Governor Ducey's order came just days after the University of California system said COVID-19 vaccines will be mandatory for students, faculty and staff beginning this fall. A new report warns the Earth is trapping about twice as much heat as it did just 16 years ago, largely due to the buildup of greenhouse gases in its atmosphere. The study by NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, finds human activity is at least partly to blame for the increase in Earth's energy imbalance. Meanwhile, record heat continues to bake the western United States with Salt Lake City this week, tying its all-time record of 107 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature in Death Valley, California, Wednesday reached 129 degrees Fahrenheit, or 54 degrees Celsius, just a few degrees shy of the highest temperature ever recorded on Earth. The House of Representatives has passed a bill enshrining Juneteenth as a federal holiday commemorating the end of slavery. The celebration marks June 19, the day in 1865, that enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, learned of the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln more than two years prior, and that the Civil War had ended. Texas Democratic Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who's African American, called the roll. On this vote, the yeas are 415 and the nays are 14. The bill is passed. <laughs> 
Since the Senate passed the bill this week, the bill now heads to President Biden for his signature. Several members of the Congressional Black Caucus spoke in favor of the federal Juneteenth holiday, including New Jersey Democrat Bonnie Watson Coleman. Juneteenth is a day for me of commemoration, not of celebration, it, because it reminds us of something that was delayed in happening. It also reminds me of what we don't have today, and that is full access to justice, freedom and equality. All of these are often in short supply as it relates to the black community, and it is still delayed. The Justice Department has overturned Trump-era rules that prevented survivors of domestic violence and families targeted by violent gangs from receiving asylum in the United States. Immigration rights group Al Otro Lado, or the other side, said, quote, this is going to make the difference between life or death for so many people fleeing danger. The Biden administration's restored protections for trans students against discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. The move reverses the Trump administration's exclusion of trans students from protections under Title IX, a 1972 federal law barring discrimination on the basis of sex. In a victory for reproductive rights, a federal court ruled Wednesday North Carolina's ban on abortions after 20 weeks is unconstitutional and creates a credible threat of prosecution for providers. A lawyer with the Center for Reproductive Rights, who argued the case, celebrated the ruling, saying, quote, forcing someone to continue a pregnancy against their will is a violation of their basic humanity, their rights and their freedom, they said. In related news, in Missouri, a federal court last week blocked a ban on abortions after eight weeks of pregnancy. In Mexico, authorities have identified remains belonging to one of the 43 disappeared and likely massacred students from a teacher's college in Ayotzinapa, Guerrero. The student has been named as Josevani Guerrero. He is just the third person in the group to have been found and identified. The 2014 disappearance led to the intense public outrage and protests. Families of the disappeared students have long maintained the military was involved in the mass abduction. In Peru, socialist presidential candidate Pedro Castillo has declared victory after final count showed him with a 44,000-vote lead over right-wing politician Keiko Fujimori, the daughter of Peru's imprisoned former dictator. Fujimori has claimed voter fraud without evidence and has promised to challenge certification of Castillo's win. On Tuesday, Castillo tweeted an image of himself with his arms raised in victory over the words president and his campaign slogan, no more poor in a rich country. Castillo has promised to raise taxes on Peru's lucrative copper mining industry and to fund health care and education initiatives and to reduce Peru's vast income inequality. Democratic Massachusetts Congress member Jim McGovern is calling on President Biden to end deadly U.S. sanctions against Venezuela, suggesting they amount to collective punishment. McGovern, who is chair of the House Human Rights Commission, says sanctions aimed at forcing President Nicolas Maduro from power instead pushed millions of people into poverty and hunger while denying them health care and other basic services during the pandemic. This is Congress member McGovern speaking to peace activists earlier this year. Year. It has resulted in needless death. It has resulted in people not getting the medical supplies that, quite frankly, can keep them alive. It has resulted in food shortages. It has resulted in a lot of suffering. China's military sent 28 warplanes into airspace controlled by Taiwan Tuesday, a record number since it began flying sorties off the coast of Taiwan on a near daily basis last year. In response, Taiwan scrambled jet fighters, activated missile defense systems and issued warnings to the Chinese pilots. The tensions came a day after President Biden successfully pushed NATO leaders to declare China to be a security risk for the first time. China has repeatedly warned the U.S. against intervening in Taiwan, which China claims as its sovereign territory. China has launched three astronauts on a three-month mission to its new space station in low Earth orbit. China built its own station after the U.S. banned Chinese astronauts, known as Taikonauts, from the International Space Station. 
It's China's first crewed mission since 2016 and follows two other recent successes, a sample return mission from the moon and the deployment of a rover on Mars. China is just the second nation after the United States to operate a rover on the Red Planet. Saudi Arabia has beheaded a man accused of taking part in anti-government riots when he was a teenager. Tuesday's execution of 26-year-old Mustafa Hashem Ardawish came despite international outcry. He was imprisoned in 2015 for allegedly participating in a protest of minority Shia Muslim youth demanding jobs and an end to discrimination at the height of the Arab Spring in 2011 and 2012. Al-Darwish was just 17 or 18 years old at the time of the uprising. Human rights groups say Saudi Arabia has carried out at least 26 executions this year. A warning to our audience, this headline contains graphic descriptions of police violence. In Hawaii, three Honolulu police officers are facing murder charges after the fatal shooting of a teenage boy in April. Jeffrey Tom, the officer who shot the boy, initially claimed 16-year-old I remember Sykap, who was driving at the time of the killing, rammed his car into him. But prosecutors say body cam footage does not match the officer's account. In another case of police violence from Honolulu, the family and lawyers of a black South African man are demanding answers and justice for Lindani Mayani, who was shot dead by police in April. Surveillance video from a doorbell shows Mayani removed his shoes and entered a house immediately after a couple, but shortly thereafter exited and apologized multiple times. The woman who entered the home ahead of Mayani called 911 to report a burglary, but when police arrived on the scene, they did not announce themselves before confronting and eventually shooting Mayani dead. His lawyers say he confused the home with a neighboring house, which acts as a place of worship and is open to the public. Mayani's wife has filed a wrongful death lawsuit accusing the police of racial discrimination. Texas Republican Governor Greg Abbott has signed a bill allowing people to carry guns without a permit or training if they're not prohibited by state or federal law from possessing a firearm. Abbott signed the bill privately Wednesday and will hold a ceremonial signing this morning at the Alamo in San Antonio. Texas joins 20 other states with similar laws. Meanwhile, in California, San Jose's city council voted unanimously Tuesday to require gun shops to record firearm purchases. The ordinance follows last month's mass shooting in a San Jose rail yard, when a gunman with a history of sexual assault killed nine people before turning the gun on himself. Back in New York, Jack Weinstein, a Brooklyn federal judge who sat on the bench for over half a century and oversaw landmark class action lawsuits, died here at the age of 99. In 1984, he approved a $180 million settlement for Vietnam War veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange. He also ruled on key cases against gun manufacturers and big tobacco. In Puerto Rico, another power failure left hundreds of thousands of homes in the dark across the island late Wednesday. This is the second major outage following the recent takeover of the electric grid by the U.S. and Canadian company Luma Energy. Labor unions and others have been protesting against the privatization of Puerto Rico's energy network. And in Greece, the conservative-led parliament has passed a bill that allows employees to work more hours in a day in exchange for time off. The bill was condemned by opposition lawmakers and labor unions, which organized strikes and demonstrations in response. This is a protester speaking from Athens Wednesday. Workers are determined not to allow our rights to be destroyed, not to go back to previous centuries. We will protect the eight-hour workday, which was one with blood, and we will not allow anyone to profit on our backs. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. When we come back, the Biden-Putin summit. It lasted three hours. What happened? Stay with us.
You're not good enough. Blood orange. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report and The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York with Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. President Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin met in Geneva, Switzerland, Wednesday, for a three-hour summit. The two leaders of the world's largest nuclear powers agreed to set up working groups to deal with nuclear arms control, as well as cyber attacks. Biden and Putin also agreed to send ambassadors back to their posts in the United States and Russia. In March, Russia withdrew its ambassador in Washington after Biden called Putin a killer during a television interview. The United States then pulled its ambassador in Moscow in April. After their summit, the two leaders held solo news conferences. This is President Biden. I did what I came to do. Number one, identify areas of practical work our two countries can do to advance our mutual interest and also benefit the world. Two, communicate directly, directly, that the United States will respond to actions that impair our vital interest or those of our allies. And three, to clearly lay out our country's priorities and our values so we heard it straight from me. President Biden went on to warn there would be, quote, devastating consequences if jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny died. Biden also warned the U.S. would use its significant cyber capability if Russia waged a cyber attack on critical infrastructure in the United States. Putin described the conversation with Biden as constructive. I believe that there was no hostility. On the contrary, our meeting, of course, took place in a principled manner. Our assessments on many points differ, but in my opinion, both sides demonstrated a desire to understand each other and look for ways to bring their positions closer. The conversation was very constructive. After Biden's news conference ended, CNN reporter Caitlin Collins yelled a question to the president. Why are you so confident he'll change his behavior, Mr. President? I, I'm not confident he's changed his behavior. What the hell? What do you do all the time? When did I say I was confident? I said, I said, what I said was, let's get it straight. I said, what will change their behavior is if the rest of the world reacts to them and it diminishes their standing in the world. I'm not confident of anything. I'm just stating the fact. But given his past behavior has not changed, and in that press conference after sitting down with you for several hours, he denied any involvement in cyber attacks. He downplayed human rights abuses. He even refused to say Alexei Navalny's name. So how does that account to a constructive meeting as president, President Putin? Frank? You don't understand that. You're in the wrong business. Did you find it's some common ground? ground? Thank you. President Biden later apologized, saying to Caitlin Collins uh, for being a, quote, wise guy. To talk more about the Biden-Putin summit, we're joined by Anatole Levin, senior fellow for Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He's the author of numerous books on Russia and the former Soviet republics. His most recent book, titled Climate Change and the Nation State, The Case for Nationalism in a Warming World, it'll be released as an updated paperback in September. He's joining us from Doha. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Anatole Levin. If you can start off by just laying out what you think was most critical about the summit that took place yesterday between Putin and Biden. First of all, it restored normal diplomatic relations you know, of a kind which exist between most countries on the face of the earth. Ambassadors have gone back. Hopefully, consular officials will go back. You know, ordinary personal exchanges will, will be restored. And, you know, that, that is of considerable importance in itself and helps open the way for other things. Secondly, uh, uh, a more cooperative atmosphere has been established so that uh, the USA uh, and Russia can work together, as President Biden stressed, uh, in areas where their common interests do actually coincide. Afghanistan was mentioned. It was mentioned by both leaders in the context of terrorism, but um, actually, after the US military withdrawal, Russia and other neighbors of Afghanistan will be critical. Uh, to the success of any peace process or any hope of stabilizing Afghanistan. Um, so that was very important. And uh, we saw the beginnings 
instruments. I mean, only the beginnings, of course, of talks which could in future uh, lead to agreement on further nuclear arms reductions. I mean, in principle, that should not be difficult. I mean, both the USA and Russia have far, far more missiles than they actually need. China has demonstrated you can have a, a perfectly credible nuclear deterrent with a fraction of those numbers. And equally importantly, uh, has begun the process or continued the process uh, of negotiation of a treaty on cyberspace. That will take a long time and will be very difficult, it may not happen, but you, know, you have to start somewhere. Uh, and finally, uh, and I, I think that is very important, uh, both uh, leaders set out their red lines. Um, at least we know Biden did because he said so, you know, which is uh, attacks on critical U.S. Uh, infrastructure, cyber attacks, uh, and uh, if Navalny dies. Uh, but um, Putin you know, restated Russia's strong opposition to further NATO enlargement, and Russia has made it well, has actually fought on a couple of occasions uh, over precisely that issue. Uh, and um, Russia has made it clear that in the event of a Ukrainian military offensive uh, against the Russian protected separatist area of eastern Ukraine, Russia will also fight. So I think um, those are the, 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 the main positive results of this summit. And Anatoly, but I wanted to ask you, in terms of how, especially here in the U.S., the media portray uh, uh, the relations with Russia as Russia being the aggressor uh, and uh, all, uh, Russian aggression having to be stemmed, could you talk about how, from the Russian perspective, the continued expansion of NATO uh, after the collapse of the Soviet bloc uh, is seen as itself uh, uh, unbridled aggression by the West. Yes, I mean, Russia sees NATO as a deeply anti-Russian organization. Uh, and of course, uh, Russia, like any country, um, deeply dislikes the idea of a hostile military alliance uh, approaching its borders um, and taking over its neighbors. Now, in the case of um, Ukraine, this is particularly sensitive, because, of course, Ukraine has a very large ethnic Russian minority. Um, and Crimea, which Russia, of course, annexed, this has not been internationally recognized, in 2014, contains one of Russia's most important and historic military bases at Sevastopol. So the Russians, for many, many years, uh, made clear that they would react, um, uh, if necessary, with force against NATO moves of this kind. There was absolutely no grounds at all to be surprised, therefore, by Russia's reaction in 2014 to the Ukrainian revolution. And <clears throat> the Russians repeatedly used the phrase Monroe Doctrine uh, to say that, look, you know, America has always been bitterly opposed, uh, categorically opposed uh, to countries in Central America joining any anti-American alliance and has used extremely ruthless measures um, to prevent that during the Cold War. So, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily that the Russians are, at least in private, claiming to represent a moral position, but they are claiming to represent a realist position. And they say that in practice, that is what America does as well when its vital interests are threatened. And, and speaking of a realist uh, tradition, uh, President Biden said uh, 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 after the summit, he said, quote, how would it be if the United States were viewed by the rest of the world as interfering with the elections directly of other countries and everybody knew it? What would it be like if we engaged in activities that he engaged in? It diminishes the standing of a country. Uh, and he was referring to uh, uh, Russia's uh, alleged interference in U U.S. elections. Uh, your reaction to President Biden's statement? Well, it's also much a question of my reaction. Um, uh, you know, th this kind of American statement causes hysterical laughter in Latin America. 
um, in large parts of Asia, uh, and by the way, in Russia itself, where uh, America brought very heavy influence to bear uh, in the elections of the 1990s in support of Boris Yeltsin, who was you know, America's candidate, if you like. Um, I mean, the, the suggestion that America has not interfered in other uh, people's elections, uh, tried very hard to influence them through every possible measure of propaganda and bribery. And, of course, uh, in a good many instances, uh, has supported coups to actually overturn those elections, as in Algeria, to take only one example, uh, in 1992, or, you know, in Egypt since then, in Chile, if you go back to the 1970s. I mean, th this does indicate a kind of blissful lack of self-awareness on the part of President Biden. Um, uh, that, of course, really discredits him and America in, in the eyes of ordinary Russians, including many ordinary Russians who really dislike Putin and the Putin administration by now. Uh, you know, they are perfectly well aware of the corruption and the oppressiveness of that administration. But they, they regard this kind of lecture by the United States as just totally hypocritical. Let's go to President Biden in his own words on, on this issue. How would it be if the United States were viewed by the rest of the world as interfering with the elections directly of other countries and everybody knew it? What would it be like if we engaged in activities that he is engaged in? It diminishes the standing of a country. In fact, the United States, as you just pointed out, has this long history of interfering. By one count from Carnegie Mellon University professor Dove Levin, the U.S. interfered in 81 foreign presidential elections between 1946 and 2000, and that doesn't include U.S.-backed coups and regime change. Um, I wanted to go to the issue of—here um, uh, is ABC reporter uh, Rachel Scott questioning the Russian president, uh, Vladimir Putin. Your political opponents who are dead, prisoned or jailed is long. Alexei Navalny's organization calls for free and fair elections, an end to corruption. But Russia has outlawed that organization, calling it extremists. And you have now prevented anyone who supports him to run for office. So my question is, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? The United States has a law that spells out that the United States will support specific entities and organizations in Russia. At the same time, the Russian Federation was labeled as an adversary. They went on the record and said on publicly that they will stymie the development of Russia. We've labeled them as foreign agents, but we haven't banned them. I mean, they can operate, all right. If you're labeled as a foreign agent, it does not preclude you from, from operating in the country. Well, if it's an extremist organization, that's a whole new story, whole different story. Uh, the organization is in question publicly has called for uh, riots and public disorder. It has openly instructed, instructed people on how to, how to make Molotov cocktails. So, if you could address this issue of Alexei Navalny um, and what Biden said. And also, I mean, this was a summit between Biden and Putin, obviously president of Russia, where Ed Snowden is. He can't come home to the United States for fear of being in prison for the rest of his life as a whistleblower. This is also the week, the 50th anniversary, of the release of the Pentagon Papers and the celebration of whistleblower Dan Ellsberg. And you've got Julian Assange wasting away in a high-security British prison as the U.S. refuses, the Biden administration refuses, to drop extradition requests against him to bring him to the U.S., where he faces over 170 years in jail. Anatole Levin. Well, I mean, you know, undoubtedly, uh, Russia under Putin has become, you know, much more authoritarian. Uh, and, yes, I mean, opposition parties have, in effect, been banned, uh, and leading opposition figures have been murdered, um, although, you know, we don't have definite proof of who was responsible. But naturally, there must be serious suspicions. Uh, now, that is not something that happens in the United States, I'm very happy to say. Uh, but you're quite right. Um, 
the US record is not spotless. And uh, I was frankly astonished uh, earlier this year uh, when Belarus forced down a, a plane in order to arrest an opposition journalist, uh, something which, by the way, I, I deeply condemn and oppose. Uh, but if we're talking of Edward Snowden, uh, of course, the United States and its NATO allies did exactly the same thing to the presidential plane of the president of Bolivia, forced it down in, in Vienna in order to search that plane for Edward Snowden. So, you know, in in issues like this, in issues of election interference uh, in other countries, I mean, here, this really is a case of the kettle calling, the American kettle calling the Russian pot black. On the other hand, I am glad that Biden uh, did uh, issue this warning to Putin uh, about Navalny, uh, because, I mean, it is actually true. If Navalny dies in, in Russian custody, uh, the impact on relations between Russia and Europe, as well as Russia and the USA, uh, will indeed be appalling. So it's just as well to, to tell President Putin that. I should add, I was just talking about um, uh, whistleblowers who are dealing with the United States, that Daniel Hale, who is also a whistleblower, who, who released classified information on uh, drones and targeted assassinations, um, faces sentencing in, in uh, July. And um, Reality Winner has just been released from prison after serving years there for her release of information, her family calling for her to be Pardon. She wasn't released into freedom, but into a halfway house. Juan. Yeah, I wanted to uh, go back to for a second to Afghanistan. How little was dealt with in terms of Afghanistan at uh, at this meeting of the of uh, Putin and Biden, given the enormous. Uh, in, uh, impact that wars in Afghanistan have had in both countries. Obviously, Russia spent 10 years bogged down in, in a, a, a war a occupation and a war in Afghanistan against uh, G jihadist uh, guerrillas and ultimately was defeated and had to leave. And the United States has spent more than 20 years, no, 20 years now uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. I'm wondering your sense of uh, whether both leaders were, in essence, trying to avoid the issue? Uh, I'm afraid it may be even worse than that. Um, I think that there is by now a profound American lack of interest in Afghanistan. You know, um, to a considerable extent, the American establishment has given up on the place um, and uh, is just anxious to get out and hopes that it will hold together for, if you remember the phrase, a decent interval, so that when it eventually collapses, uh, people will not so much blame the United States or see it as an American defeat. Uh, but, I mean, what it also illustrates, I think, is this tendency in Washington to believe that America must not just be involved in, but must lead every important process in every part of the world. And if America is not going to be there, it loses interest and certainly has very little interest in coordinating regional countries. Because, uh, of course, the, the point is that America, I, I, we always knew that America would go home sooner or later. I mean, we hoped with better success than it has done in Afghanistan. But, you know, America lives, what, 7,000 miles from Afghanistan? Uh, Russia is very close to Afghanistan. China, Iran, Pakistan are actually on Afghanistan's borders. They will always be concerned with what happens in Afghanistan. They also have the same interests as the United States in combating ISIS and international Islamist terrorism, as, as does India. Uh, and they all fear the consequences of a new outright civil war in Afghanistan. So, you know, this was a real opportunity for America to, through Russia, to talk to the region about coordinating future approaches. Uh, because without a regional consensus uh, on Afghanistan, uh, I am afraid that there will be no possibility uh, of peace there in future. Uh, and in terms of uh, Ukraine, again, this is a, a, a red line issue in terms of, of Russia uh, and uh, and the possibility of Ukraine uh, uh, entering NATO. What do you what do you 
What's your expectation of how that this will develop, whether NATO will keep trying to uh, to recruit Ukraine? Well, it was very interesting, you know, um, uh, yesterday, or was it the day before now, President Zelensky of, of Ukraine you know, issued a, a tweet claiming that Biden had you know, extended an immediate offer of NATO membership. That, of course, was not true. Uh, and it was an attempt, quite obviously, to trap the Biden administration into making this offer. Uh, apparently, that was the reason why um, Biden's uh, first press conference uh, in, uh, in Geneva was delayed by uh, two and a half hours, while the U.S. administration or the Biden team formulated a response, which once again, you know, talked about the possibility in future uh, of NATO, uh, NATO membership for Ukraine remaining open, but made absolutely no, you know, actual commitment to that for the foreseeable future. Because there are two basic facts which must be acknowledged. The, the first is that NATO will not take Ukraine in as long as it has ongoing military conflicts with Russia, because that would point directly towards uh, NATO having to go to war with Russia over the Donbass and, and Crimea. And you know, I mean, the very thought of that is ridiculous, you know, to risk nuclear war for separatist provinces of, of Ukraine. Uh, and in any case, uh, any move in that direction would be vetoed by half a dozen European NATO members. Uh, the second point to bring out is that um, the West will not fight for Ukraine. We didn't fight for Georgia in 2008, despite many semi-promises. We didn't fight for Ukraine in 2014. Despite this very you know, loose and sloppy use of the word alliance, Ukraine is not an ally. <clears throat> it will not be saved by the West in a, in a war with Russia. So. Um, I think the whole issue of NATO membership for Ukraine has become, frankly, uh, empty and theoretical. This is a can which will be endlessly kicked down the road, continuing, by the way, to you know, alarm and irritate the Russians, uh, but not actually leading to, to anything in practical terms. Can we talk about a subject that really wasn't so much in the news yesterday, which was China? You have China's military sending 28 warplanes into airspace control by Taiwan Tuesday, a record number since it began flying these sorties on a daily basis. In response, uh, Taiwan scrambled jet fighters, activated defense systems. Um, the tensions coming just a day before uh, Biden successfully pushed NATO leaders to declare China to be a security risk for the first time. And and behind the scenes, you have Europe pushing back on the United States uh, that, although Biden said he doesn't want to have a new Cold War with Russia, looks like he's pushing for a Cold War with Russia and China. Talk about uh, the country that wasn't included in this summit. Yes, well, from a, you know, a, a realist point of view, um, uh, America for the past 20 years has, you know, violated fundamental principle of realism 101, as, by the way, Henry Kissinger, the arch realist, has discreetly, diplomatically pointed out. It has driven its two main adversaries together instead of separating them. Uh, and um, instead of, as it did, you know, Kissinger and Nixon in the 1970s uh, took China, the weaker communist state, and turned it against the Soviet Union, the stronger one. There would be many opportunities to take you know, Russia, and if not turn it against China, at least keep it away from China. But that obviously is not going to happen as long as the United States and the West um, extends NATO, you know, up to Russia's borders. Russia is bound to see that as the principal threat. Uh, the result is that Russia has been driven closer and closer to China in a way, by the way, that makes a good many Russians in private pretty anxious, you know, this fear that in, in future Russia will simply be a kind of dependency of China. Uh, but as far as they can see, there's not much they can do about it, given, you know, U.S. policy uh, t towards Russia. I mean, on, uh, you know, these NATO statements of uh, China being an adversary, uh, the European Union is much more important, because it's a question of economic pushback 
against aspects of Chinese policy, uh, against you know China buying up infrastructure, uh, against China trying to dominate you know aspects of international communications, Huawei 5G. Now there, the European Union, you know, actually does play a critical role uh, alongside the United States, and you know that, that's why, of course, the Biden administration has devoted so much attention to getting the European on, Union on side, but. NATO, frankly, given its miserable performance you know, in Afghanistan, and given that, the, uh, Britain aside, the, uh, the actual NATO offer of forces to sort of, if you like, side with America in the Indo-Pacific uh, amounts to date to one warship, one frigate or destroyer at a time. Um, that isn't going to worry the Chinese. You know, NATO is NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's the ultimate backstop against Russian aggression into Western or Central Europe. Uh, but um, every attempt to extend NATO out, out of area uh, has proved a failure. It's just not configured for that. And one of the reasons it's con it's not configured for that is that the most of the European countries, once again, exception of Britain and France, simply will not fight. You know, they won't fight in any circumstances, seriously. Um, they're, you know, they, they are there to, to, to defend Western Europe. And you know, in the, the unbelievable scenario that Western Europe was invaded, they would fight to defend their homelands. But you're not going to get them to de deploy seriously against China. It's a non-issue. Anatole Levin, I want to thank you for being with us, Senior Fellow for Russia and Europe at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, author of many books on Russia and the former Soviet republics, his forthcoming book, Climate Change in the Nation State, The Case for Nationalism in a Warming World. Next up, we look at the mayoral race here in New York City. Early voting is already underway. Ranked choice voting will be used to decide the winner. The candidates held their final debate last night. Stay with us. Was the man Fred's? Three, two, one by Manfred Mann. Think rank choice voting. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Yes, early voting is underway in a historic New York City Democratic primary election for the mayor and many other key races. It's the first time in a citywide election voters will use rank choice voting to choose up to five candidates in order of preference. In the mayor's race, Brooklyn Borough President, former New York City Police Captain Eric Adams has led recent polls, while businessmen and former Former presidential candidate Andrew Yang seems to be falling behind. The race also includes civil rights attorney Maya Wiley, the former sanitation commissioner Catherine Garcia, New York City controller Scott Stringer, former nonprofit executive Diane Morales, former federal housing secretary Sean Donovan and businessman Ray McGuire. The top mayoral candidates took the stage last night for a final debate. This spirit exchange came when the candidates were asked about the worst idea they've heard from their opponent. We'll hear from Eric Adams, Ray McGuire and Diane Morales. But first, Maya Wiley. My godson, who is six three, six foot three and feet tall, black and beautiful, I've had to accompany him to court for riding a skateboard while black. I've had to accompany him to court for sitting in a park while black. And the worst idea I've ever heard is bringing back stop and frisk and the anti-crime unit from Eric Adams, which one is racist, two is unconstitutional, and three didn't stop any crime, and four it will not happen in a Maya Wiley administration. 
Ten seconds, Mr. Adams. Uh, you don't have to worry about danger when you have private security in your on your block. Uh, I don't and never will allow stop and frisk to be returned and abuse people. I know real solution for real people in New York is you have private security. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Eric Adams is feeling the momentum, and let me just say that the important issue for New Yorkers is that everyone understands that public safety is broad, complex, and it means making sure we're spending our dollars wisely, and I will have a moral budget that protects all our people. Let's be very clear for black and brown communities, neither defund the police nor stop and frisk, You don't nor speak for black security. and brown communities. <laughs> How dare you assume to speak for black and brown communities Did I talk to black and brown monolith? communities? Did you I cannot talk to them? do that. You cannot do that. Oh, the I can't. Yes, I, I just did. actually was started you know what? by young I black and brown people. You, you know what? I just do, did do it. You can't erase them in that can't way. Talk that over other. I'm going to do it again. the truth for the community as a whole. Those last voices, Diane Morales uh, taking on Ray McGuire, an excerpt from last night's New York City mayoral debate, uh, the last one before the June 22nd Democratic primary, though people are already voting. Uh, but that January 22nd, voters choosing also candidates for 51 city council seats from among hundreds of people running, as well as city controller, who's the city's chief fiscal officer and budget watchdog, and the Manhattan district attorney. For more, we're joined by Ross Barkin, an investigative journalist who's closely following the primary, a columnist for The Guardian and Jacobin. He also has a new book coming out next week titled The Prince, Andrew Cuomo, Coronavirus and the Fall of New York. Welcome to Democracy Now! Now, Ross. So, for an audience in the rest of the country and around the world, if you can talk about the significance of the mayoral race, uh, its ups and downs, um, and who really is uh, vying to run this city. Sure. So, New York City obviously is by far the biggest city in America. And, and while I wouldn't necessarily call it a trendsetter, you are having far more people vote in this municipal contest than any other municipal contest in any other city. It's really more akin to a statewide race. So there are millions of registered Democrats, probably 800,000 Democrats are going to vote next Tuesday. So, you know, the winner is really will be competing and trying to win many different uh, factions and that are somewhat representative of the Democratic Party. So, so New York, while has a reputation, it is very much a left of center city, and it is, it's much more progressive than it used to be. There are still a wide array of different people who are coming to vote. It's an incredibly diverse electorate. You have black voters, you have Latino voters, you have Orthodox Jews, you have um, young affluent voters and educated voters, you have working class voters. It really is this tremendous mix of people. And while I wouldn't go as far to say that the winner can say something about the future of the Democratic Party, you can say that within New York City, there is an incredible amount of diversity even in that Democratic electorate. And right now, there are four candidates, I would say, who really have a shot. You know, the famous one is Andrew Yang, the former presidential candidate and entrepreneur. There's Eric Adams, the Brooklyn Borough President, who's a former police captain, would be the city's second black mayor. And there are two women who are competing to be the first female mayors of New York City ever, and, and that is Maya Wiley, who uh, worked for Bill de Blasio as his counsel, Bill de Blasio, the outgoing mayor, and Catherine Garcia, who also worked as, at, for Bill de Blasio as his uh, sanitation commissioner. They'll all have been quite critical of de Blasio, which is very interesting. And I would say, finally, there are definitely competing currents kind of with the left versus the center in this race, where you have candidates who are taking on more moderate postures on policing, on, on crime, even on economics. And then you have candidates who are also hewing to the left on, on issues as well. So you have a real competition of ideas. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the, the other big thing that's happening this uh, this time around, is ranked choice voting. And I'm uh, 
actually pretty uh, worried about the, the counting of ranked choice voting, given the fact that the New York City Board of Elections is notorious for botching uh, election procedures. Uh, and now they're going to be dealing with this very complicated uh, system of, uh, of determining who the winner is. I, I worry this thing, this thing could go on for weeks and months in terms of challenges to even figure out who won. Wondering your sense of to what degree voters understand ranked choice voting? Voters, I think for a long time, did not have a great understanding. I do see the awareness increasing a lot. You're seeing interviews with voters who are now going to vote in early voting who say, yes, I understand. I early voted myself, and I've seen the ballot. It is clearer than I thought it would be, which was good. I agree, though. The Board of Elections in, in New York City and New York State is notoriously dysfunctional and patronage-ridden. We will not know the outcome of the vote on Tuesday because a New York state law mandates that the absentee ballots, ballots get counted after the election. This is not true in a lot of other states. So this is a law that has yet to be changed. So the absentee ba ballots must be counted first. Then you enter into the RCV calculation. And so the tabulation of these votes won't occur until July. That is without any any kind of malfeasance, that's just the schedule we're on right now. Post July 4th, they will tabulate all the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth place votes, and then you will have a winner. It's possible on election night you may see a candidate far ahead, and you could probably guess that candidate will win. It's also possible the candidates could be bunched up where there is a lot of unpredictability. And perhaps the first place finisher does not win. You see rare instances where the first place finisher, in fact, loses out to another candidate. And I wanted to uh, ask you, the, the battle over who's the progressive candidate here, it's a, it clearly Maya Wiley has been emerging in recent weeks as the as the, the standard bearer of, of many of the progressives uh, in New York City. Uh, but I, I, I know several of these people. I've known them for years. I've, I've known Eric Adams personally for more than 30 years. And uh, uh, while well, he has been portrayed as the more conservative candidate, uh, people forget that when uh, I knew him when he was a sergeant in the uh, in the transit police in New York City, uh, fighting racism within the department uh, and uh, and also fighting police abuse within the department. It's a lot harder to fight police abuse from within the department than it is from outside the department. But there's no doubt he's increasingly become more conservative as years have, have gone on. I'm wondering. Uh, among these candidates, who do you uh, uh, who, who do you see as uh, having the momentum in recent months uh, to uh, po potentially win? Eric Adams definitely has a good chance because he is putting together a very reliable coalition, which is working class blacks and then moderate white voters, Orthodox Jews, outer borough ethnics. You know, these are people who do who do show up to vote. So. If you're trying to win a mayoral race, having support from the black community is very important. Bill de Blasio had the same in his 2013 race. So Eric Adams definitely has an inside track right now. And you're right. He came up out of this police reform movement. He still talks about police reform, but he's also campaigning as a tough on crime mayor, certainly very aggressively against to fund the police. He's also very close to the real estate industry and supportive of landlords and not particularly friendly to tenant issues. So that, that that's kind of his posture. And you have Andrew Yang, who similarly has been positioning himself as a tough on crime uh, candidate, though with, with fresher or newer ideas, but also someone who says he takes public safety very seriously. It, it's really Maya Wiley, who is now as the standard bearer, sort of by default, Scott Stringer accused of sexual assault, another candidate, Diane Morales, imploded. Wiley is not necessarily the favorite of various socialists and progressive groups, but she is now the default. And so there's been a coalescing around her. AOC endorsed her. So it'll be very interesting to see where she ends up, if she can come from behind and win and pull a de Blasio. Remember, at this point in the primary eight years ago, de Blasio had established himself as a clear front runner. Right now, that's Adams, but Adams does not have the lead that de Blasio did have in 2013. So I, I would say the race is much more volatile than it was back then.
And you have this front page piece in the New York Times a few days ago saying, I mean, here you had Maya Wiley, who's gotten the endorsement of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, 1199, the union, uh, and other progressives. Uh, but you, the front page piece was about de Blasio, even though she was his lawyer, um, a city lawyer. Um, uh, working behind the scenes for Adams, saying in that way he would preserve his progressive legacy. Yeah, it's a strange thing, because I would not agree with de Blasio that Eric Adams is best positioned to preserve his legacy. But the thing with politics is a lot of it's personal. Eric Adams and Bill de Blasio go back a long time. Eric Adams, I would say, unlike a lot of other politicians, was not known for attacking Bill de Blasio when he was mayor. It was not known for gratuitous criticisms of Bill de Blasio when he was mayor. Uh, the two always seemed to have an understanding. Both Maya Wiley and Catherine Garcia worked for de Blasio now have been quite critical of him and also, you know, not to, don't speak warmly about their time in City Hall. So I can imagine for de Blasio himself, he is aggrieved that he gave both of them jobs and promotions, and they are not grateful in any way. Uh, that's politics. I mean, uh, I'd say, unfortunately, it's not always about policy and ideology. It, it can be about these kinds of relationships. So Eric Adams is the person Bill de Blasio feels most personally comfortable with. He is trying to rally, organize labor behind Adams. He's been pretty successful at that. And, you know, so far, the race is going I would say de Blasio's way, and that Adams is the favorite, and Yang has lost strength, but anything can happen on primary day. There's still a lot of variables. And of course, you mentioned Catherine Garcia, who uh, surprisingly the, the, uh, has gotten the editorial endorsements uh, in, the, in the major papers, including the New York Times. And there are some analysts who believe that because, due to ranked choice voting, she may not come out at the top of the uh, uh, at the front of the pack, but through ranked choice voting, she may end up uh, actually uh, winning the primary. Your th your sense of Catherine Garcia's role? She's definitely come on very strong. The, the New York Times endorsement was a big surprise. Um, originally, I would have guessed Scott Stringer would have gotten it, but then he was accused of sexual assault. So that fell by the wayside. Then I personally imagine that Maya Wiley would get it because she was positioning herself as a liberal candidate, sort of in the, in the mold of what the New York Times usually endorses. But they really went out of left field a bit and, and supported G Catherine Garcia, who's really running as a technocratic moderate, someone who's supportive of charter schools, someone who is against taxing the rich, someone who is fairly supportive of the real estate industry and skeptical of rent stabilization. That being said, I think, unlike Eric Adams, Catherine Garcia is less alienating to some voters. You know, Adams and Yang each have the challenge of ending up on a lot of ballots. You know, both of them now um, have the potential to be dropped from the ballots of a lot of highly educated progressives and high information voters. You know, each of them have sustained negative news cycles. Each of them cause voters who read the New York Times to recoil. Catherine Garcia does not. So she does have some potential because she's going to show up on a lot of ballots. Andrew Yang himself helped elevate her when he said she was his number two. And it's possible that will backfire in him in the end, because she is going to be people's number twos. And she we're going we're gonna to have to leave it there. But I thank you so much for being with us. Ross Barkin, his new book, The Prince. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.